enjoyed that, Janet. Thank you. Amen. Turn to Psalm 25 with me. Psalm 25. We started this this morning, and uh, let me just give you a couple of reminders from some things we shared this morning. This psalm, above all else, demonstrates our complete and our total reliance upon the Lord. We find that if that if that that if we are to know anything regarding the Lord, it must be through complete and total surrender to Him, uh, to surrender to His will, and for, uh, seek to His forgiveness for our sins, uh, to be uh, to keep a strong and a right fellowship with Him, to make sure that we're able to sit at His feet and learn of Him. Such an important thing. David, the writer of this psalm, completely and totally gets it. And so he starts his psalm off with the idea of complete surrender. He says in verse 1, Under thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. He understands that if he is to put his trust in something, it needed to be in God. You know, there's a lot of things in our society today that whether you recognize it or not, we put our trust in it. Uh, We don't always know how secure it might be, but we put our trust in it. Very often we put our trust in the banking system and uh, in hopes that when we put our money there, that it's going to be there when it comes time to need it. Uh, Those who have entrusted their money to banking systems that have failed uh, realize it's probably a pretty sorry trust system. All right. Pretty sorry thing to put our trust in. There are other things that we put our trust in. You know, there are times where you may put your trust in a spouse and, and that spouse turns out not to be able to be trusted. There are times where you put your trust in an employer or possibly an employee, and you find out later that couldn't be trusted. Uh, and there are a lot of things in this society that we try to put our trust in. But what David is telling you is this. Listen, there is none so trustworthy, so honorable as God himself. And so he says, listen, it's God that I put my trust in. And so it involves complete and total surrender on our part. Now, I say that because as he trusts God, he realizes that the absolute necessity in having a right fellowship with God revolves around the fact that knowing we are sinners who fall short of God's glory, that it revolves around the fact that we must trust the payment that Jesus Christ made on our behalf that we might have forgiveness of sin, that we might be pardoned. That's important. And if we don't understand and know and recognize that, we will not have the kind of fellowship with God that that we are in great need of. So when we talk about being pardoned for our sins, why is this so necessary? We talked about two different things this morning. We talked this morning about uh, being pardoned so that we might have spiritual direction. So we might understand and know what God would have for us in our life. You know, our spiritual direction comes completely and totally from God. And so we're not going to understand that direction if our fellowship with God doesn't exist. If our fellowship with God isn't where it ought to be, we are not going to know what God would have us to do. So we need the opportunity to, again, sit at the feet of Jesus Christ, to be able to learn of Him and see what He has to offer. How could I know a right direction in my life if I do not have fellowship with God? I can't possibly discern a a direction that I ought to go if I am not in fellowship with God. So that comes with complete and total pardon for my sins. I need that if I'm to have fellowship with the Holy God, and I don't know direction until I have fellowship with the Holy God. So, again, I need my sins to be pardoned. But a second thing we learned this morning is we need our sins pardoned because it's not possible to completely and totally glorify God as we should and to honor His name if sin is still dominant in our life can't do it you know when we think about that the sin needs to be pardoned if we are truly to glorify his name Um, I I used to do a um, a jail ministry and in that jail ministry uh, part of what I did was they had what they called a uh, they called it drug court people who had crimes that of uh, drug abuse 
Um, and in order for them to be able to get that expunged so that they could not even have it on their record, they had drug court. And they were able to go through this drug court. It was classes, and there was a variety of things they needed to do. It was sponsored by one of the judges. And so what they would do is they would go through this entire program. Once they completed that program, they would meet for a time of, of, of um, graduation, if you would. It was a time where they were given certificates, and, and basically the judge was there, and if they completed the drug court, they would come forward and he would present them with this certificate stating that their, uh, their crimes had been expunged. They'd been taken off as though they were non-existent. They had been pardoned for all they had done. And it was an interesting thing because with their record expunged, they were able then to move on with life. And if they could keep their lives clean, and if they could not show back at court, they had a clean record. They could go get a job. They could do all those things because they no longer had these things on their record. And I would sometimes, what I would do is at the end of that celebration, they usually had me come up and I would congratulate them and then I would pray for them. And that was my job um, in that regard. After one of the graduation ceremonies, it kind of spoke to my heart, but this young man came and shook hands with the judge that was a part of this. And uh, I was standing nearby. I could hear the conversation. And what the, what the young man said was this. He said, thank you for giving back my good name. And I thought about that. And I thought, you know, one of the things we lose with sin is that good name. One of the things we do when we call ourselves children of God, when we say we're a Christian and sin seems to dominate our life, another thing we do is we give Jesus Christ a bad name. We make him look bad in the sight of those around us. Well, if that's what a Christian is, I want nothing to do with it. But what a hypocrite. If that's the kind of God they serve, who wants that? And so what we find is this young man recognized that, listen, I now have my name back. When we are pardoned of our sins, it glorifies the very name of Jesus Christ. It lifts him up to know that he is who he says he is and that he is, he is glorified in the fact that we are now his children. Tonight, we want to take it a little farther. We want to look at a few other, uh, a few other things that take place as a result of pardoned sin. A third thing is this. We are able to be taught from God. We were able to be taught of God. Now listen to this, Psalm 25, 12. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. To the man, to the individual, to the person who surrenders their life to Jesus Christ, to the one who seeks God's fellowship and desires to be pardoned for their sins, to the one who wants the kind of fellowship that God desires for him, he's saying that that guy's teachable. He can learn. Have you ever had, some of you I know are teachers and, and you've been involved in maybe having to teach others, even, even beyond just like a school teacher, maybe even in school, I mean in church, or maybe on the job or whatever the case may be, and you always seem to have that one person, that one kid or that one individual that you turn around and you think to yourself, they are just unteachable. I don't want to be that person. The person whose sins are pardoned, the one who recognizes that, listen, God is a holy God and deserves for me to glorify him and to come before him and to seek his face, that is the individual that's teachable. And God says to them that they have the opportunity to be taught of God. You know, a rebellious man is deaf to the things that are right. They just don't hear it. A rebellious man does not want to hear what is right. Have you ever tried to tell somebody who is angry, somebody who is furious, somebody who wants nothing to do with that which is right, that is consumed in their sin or consumed in whatever it is they're consumed in, and in all of that you try to tell them something that is right, and they just have a deaf ear. They, they close you off. They build a wall, and they can't hear a word of what you're saying. Jesus tells us this in Matthew 13, 15, talking about the Pharisees of that day, talking about those who had decided they knew what was right and did not want to hear what Christ had to say. He says this, For this 
people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they've closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. He's saying at any moment they could listen, at any moment they could open their eyes, at any moment they could just take heart. Take note of what I'm saying. And they could be healed. They could, their sins could be forgiven. Their heart and life could be changed. But instead, they have a deaf ear and they're blinded to the truth. You know, one who rejects Jesus Christ, follows his own way, doesn't hear what God has to say. They want only to do that which is right in their own eyes and refuse to hear what God has to say and what God would have them to know. And it's not until we hear God's word that we can trust him, can seek forgiveness, and can find that pardon from sin. You know, we often try to lead others to follow God's plan, to think like a believer, to trust his path. But when they're without that pardon, when they choose rather to live in their sin, they don't hear a word we say. Amen. You know, it's the old casting your pearls before the swine. It's the concept that, listen, as long as they desire to live as they live and do as they do and reject Christ, they will not hear anything you have to share regarding Jesus Christ. I know I hear people a lot of times, they'll say, I, I don't understand why the world's going on this path. How could, how could people vote for this guy or vote for that guy? How could people vote this into legislation? How could they even consider these things and, and want them to be a part of our society? How this and how that? They're lost. They're deaf. They can't see. They have no concept of what God would have them to see, have them to hear. They have no concept. We can't expect them to be any different because they've not been pardoned for their sin. Not only that, but you know, we'll only listen to those that we respect and those that we honor. Um, I really don't have much use for somebody that's telling me something that, uh, that they think I ought to hear if I don't have any respect for them. If I feel like there's hypocrisy, or if I feel like that, you know, what they're having to say is contrary to the person that they are, or, or if they teach things typically that I know that God opposes, I don't have respect and honor to that. The same thing is true with those who reject Jesus Christ. If they have no honor, they have no respect for God, they're not going to listen. They're not going to hear what he has to say. You know, the world's been very successful in teaching a lot of what they teach. Teaching theories of evolution is fact. Distorting our history. Conveniently leaving God out of any and every equation. Teaching self-reliance. Promoting a self-centered entitlement agenda, looking to government for all the answers so that every time government speaks, we bow down to them and we do everything they tell us to do. That's what the world has taught us to do. And the fact is, they've done a really great job of it. They've been very successful in teaching that so that the bulk of the world will do whatever they tell them to do and live their life accordingly. You know, God has been systematically removed from our society. And when you look at that, they teach as though he is myth, as though he is fairy tale, illusion, and a crutch for the weak. Honor and respect for God has been completely and totally erased. So I don't know. I don't know that I'd take it that far. I would. I think I see it all the time. You know, I see things that we know to be fact taught as myth or fairy tales. I was watching something the other day, and they were doing, uh, they were talking about one of the things that they were listing as fairy tale. It was among other things that were fairy tales, and they listed Jonah and the whale, and as though it was a fairy tale, something somebody had made up and put in a book. I thought, wow, isn't that something? You see it all the time. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's not so obvious. Sometimes it's kind of just uh, snuck in there, you know. And so when we look at those pictures, what we find is our society has done all it can do to try to make us see and think that God is not real, that God is not true, that God does not exist, but rather that we need to live our lives apart from him and reject him in totality. Why? Well, because people are still in their sins. They've not repented of their sins. They've not trusted in God's redemption. 
They've not been pardoned, and therefore they cannot comprehend the truth, and instead they believe a lie. It's a shame, but we live in a society just like that. Hasn't changed, by the way. Society today isn't worse than what it was. It's still just a sinful society. We just need to recognize and know that, listen, the world doesn't love us. The world doesn't cling to what we have because they don't understand the need to be pardoned for their sin. So when we look at this picture, understand that the world is caught up in that. 2 Corinthians 4, 3, but if our gospel be hid, it says it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, by the way, that's Satan, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. What is he saying? The reason they don't believe the gospel is because Satan has blinded their eyes. He has deceived them. He has caused them to believe a lie rather than the truth of the gospel. So what happens is this. They have not been pardoned for their sin. Because they've not been pardoned for their sin, they're unteachable when it comes to spiritual things. Unteachable. So when we look at this picture, understand and know that we can't teach a lost society how to love God. What they have to see is that they're sinners in need of a Savior, and we present Jesus Christ that they might trust Him as their Lord and Savior. And until that happens, until they're pardoned for their sin, they're unteachable when it comes to spiritual things. And too often we try to fix people before they know Jesus Christ. Folks, they need to know Jesus Christ first. They're unteachable, they're unreachable until Christ has pardoned them for their sin. A fourth thing, we need to be pardoned because, quite frankly, we need to be at peace with God. i got to tell you, being at peace with God is better than being at peace with man any day of the week. Amen. Psalm 25, 13, His soul shall dwell at ease. And his seed shall inherit the earth. Nothing, nothing lacks peace like being at odds with God. I know, I've been there. Trust me, I know. I can tell you. There is no peace when we're at odds with God. We find in our text that having been pardoned from our sin penalty, that our soul will dwell at ease. Now, I'm here to tell you that doesn't mean that your physical body is going to be at ease. In fact, when we look in Scripture, we find out that these guys that were pardoned for their sin, these guys that trusted Jesus Christ, followed Jesus Christ, many of them were persecuted. Many of them died by the sword. Many of them died in jail. They were, they were arrested and they were beaten. We see over and over again that it doesn't mean that we're at peace with the world. It means we are at ease, at peace with God. That means inside. Man, I've got a comfort and a joy that the world can't comprehend. And I tell you that because I know what it's like when I'm not in the will of God. I certainly remember the first time God dealt with me. I was only 12 years old. How much has a 12-year-old boy done? You know what I'm saying? But at 12 years old, I recognized that I was going to die and go to hell if I didn't trust Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. At 12 years old, I recognized that, sitting on a pew at Salem Baptist Church, Russell Springs, Kentucky. My dad was preaching revival, and I realized this is my only hope. I need to trust Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you, it seemed to me like I might never get another opportunity to do that. It seemed to me like that was my one and only opportunity, and if I left there that night having not received Christ, I might have died and went to hell. That was the way it felt with me. In fact, I was so convicted, I couldn't sit there. I was so overwhelmed with guilt that I couldn't just sit there. I needed to do something to bring it to Jesus Christ because I needed that weight lifted off of me. It was more than I could bear. I needed to be at ease with God. And the only way that I was going to be at ease with God is for that guilt to be removed, for that sin to be taken away. And I remember the very moment my dad came up and knelt with me and began to share with me what I needed to do. And you know what? I didn't recite some little special prayer. He said, Barry, you know what you need to do, don't you? I said, no, what, Dad? He said, you just need to trust Jesus Christ and know that he died for your sins. You know we're sinners, and it's that sin that's sending you to hell. And you need to just trust Jesus. Do you trust Jesus today, Barry? 
I said, Dad, I trust him. I believe he died for my sins, and I trust him. I don't want this sin to be a part of my life. I don't want to feel like this anymore. I want to know him. And you know what? It was like that weight was just lifted right off. It was like I just had this immediate ease. There was a rest. There was this peace that fell on me like just can't imagine. I also remember when God was calling me to preach. Boy, that was a tough one. And I got to tell you, I ran from that for a while. I didn't want nothing to do with that. I saw our family. I saw the anguish. I saw the pain. I saw the hurt. I saw how difficult it was for Dad at times. The sacrifice. I saw him crying continually for individuals that he ministered to. I watched that over and over again, and I thought, this is not for me. I don't want this. I saw how people treated him and then how he would just take it and just move on. And I thought, this is not for me. I don't want anything to do with any of this. I saw how people would call him at midnight, one, two in the morning, expect him to jump and run. I thought, that's not for me. I want nothing to do with that. But God continually dealt with my heart and dealt with my life. And I got to tell you, it got to where I couldn't sleep. I was never happy. I stayed angry. I stayed hurt. I stayed everything. I was so miserable. And I knew that I was out of the will of God. I knew I wasn't doing what God had called me to do. I knew I was trying to teach Sunday school. And God called me to do all those things and wanted me to do. It wasn't that I was doing something wrong. I was doing all the right things, but I was miserable in doing them. Because God had another call that he wanted for me. I was kind of like Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire. Shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Finally, I just had to, had to give it up. God, okay. I got to do this. You want me to do it? I'll do it. And I got to be real honest with you. I wasn't doing it because it was what I wanted. But I knew without a shadow of a doubt it was what God wanted. You know, you've heard the old, uh, you've, you've, you've heard the uh, Footprints in the Sand poem. I've got an addition to that, just by the way, because it talks about, you know, the footprints in the sand, you know, when there's, when there's two sets of prints, who are that's when I'm walking beside you. And then, and then he says, well, what, what, what's this where there's only one print? And he says, well, that's where I carried you. You need to be carried. Well, I, I've got another one in there. You know, what's that skid mark behind the footprints? He said, that was when I drugged you kicking and screaming. <laughs> that was my life. I think God drugged me through my life a lot of times kicking and screaming. But I got to tell you, when I finally surrendered to preach, when I finally said, okay, God, whatever it is you want me to do, I'm done running, I'm done fighting. You're a whole lot tougher than I am. What is it you want me to do? I got to tell you, there was an ease that fell over me. There was a rest that fell upon me. There have been times when I've been out of God's will. There have been times where I've disobeyed him. When sin reared its ugly head, and by the way, just because I'm a preacher doesn't mean it doesn't happen to me, guys. I'm going to tell you now, it happens to me as much as it does you. And I really believe, and, and I'm not saying this to be offensive or anything like that, but I believe the temptations and such on a preacher are probably greater. Because if he beats me down, he tears me down, and he takes some folks with me. And i got to tell you, there's been times where I've let Satan win those battles. Not always been as strong as I'd like to be. But I got to tell you, when sin rears its ugly head and the Holy Spirit is grieved within me, you know, that's a dilemma. God placed the Holy Spirit in us when we trust him as our Lord and Savior. And with the Holy Spirit of God in my life, when I'm not where God wants me to be, he's not happy living in this old body. And I got to tell you, he makes it pretty rough. It's kind of like, you know, at home when they say, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. I'm here to tell you in my life when the Holy Spirit ain't happy. I ain't happy. And he's grieved until I come to a place where I say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. And the Holy Spirit's able to move again in my life, able to do the things he needs to do in my life. And we're able to move forward. 
been there when the Holy Spirit's been grieved in my life. And trust me, there was no peace with God in those times. And if you've never been there, I hope you never go there. Pardon brings blessings too. He says, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The peace we have with God is an inward peace that I, I'll be real honest, I can't just explain to anybody and everybody. Those who know Jesus Christ understand it. There is an inward peace, no matter how bad this world is, no matter what's going on, no matter what I'm facing, no matter what I'm dealing with, I know that the Lord's got it under control. I remember when my son had cancer. Man, it was such a difficult challenge. You know, you all have been there with different things in your life, people you love, people you care for, maybe in your own life, whatever the case, where you're having to deal with things, you just, it's bigger than you are. And it was a battle. But through it all, as difficult as it was, there was always an inner peace. God's got this. He's got this. And it was a, a matter of knowing and understanding that, listen, no matter what happens, God's still in charge. This didn't catch him off guard. This is not something that God goes, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. That doesn't happen. God knew what's going on. God took care of it. And God does what he does. And, and you know, it's a matter of trusting that. Why? Well, because I've been pardoned. I know what he did for me. I know he forgave me of my sins. I know he's forgiven me in times where I failed him. I know what he's done for me in my life and, and in all the things that surround me. Um, how can I ever doubt him? How could I ever doubt him? You know, when we look at this picture, it's because of Christ that we can boldly stand before God, dressed in his righteousness, and stand before God, righteous. Come into his presence, pardoned as though we had never sinned at all. Stand before God as pure, because when God sees and looks at me, he sees his son, Jesus Christ, and he sees me washed in his blood. When he sees me, he sees Christ. Wow. Pardoned. When I say, I've forgiven you, i got to tell you, it's nothing like when God says, I've forgiven you. My little feeble mind can't put it away. No matter how many times I say it, I hear people say, well, you've never really forgiven a person until you've forgotten. Oh, you're out of your mind. I'll tell you now. I've forgiven a lot of folks and truly and genuinely forgiven them, but my little feeble mind won't just let it go. It's still there. I can't just let it go. I'm not God. Oh, I'd love to be able to do that. I'd love to just say, well, you know what? I'm just going to pretend like it never existed. I'm going to let it go. Never remember it again. God, let me just take it out of my memory. That doesn't happen. You know, it's one of those things where I can forgive my wife, but every time we get in a little bit of a spat, that pops back up. Well, you remember when you did this? I thought we already settled that. Well, we did, but I haven't forgotten it. What's the deal? See, when God says, I've pardoned your sin, he's pardoned your sin. You know, I hear all the time people get the idea that when we stand before God in judgment that somehow or another there's going to be this big, you know, 60-inch TV screen with a whole life that's, you know, flashing across it, you know, so that we can see everything we've ever done. I don't see how that can happen when God's already forgotten everything that I did. has been washed and cleansed in the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you, when God pardoned my sin, it's cast aside. It's been expunged. No record of it anymore. It's gone. He pardoned me for that sin. And because of that now, it says he's able to bless me. To bless me. You know the difference between mercy and grace. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. I deserve hell. I deserve, you know, I'm as guilty as a day is long. I deserve whatever God throws at me. But God's merciful and he doesn't do that. But he's also gracious. Grace, grace has given me something that I don't deserve. Not only has he saved me from the very pits of hell, but he gives me heaven. He gives me fellowship with him. He gives me eternal life. I don't deserve any of that. So he doesn't give me all the things I really do deserve. And then he does give me all these things I don't deserve. 
that are just too wonderful to imagine. That's the rewards of being pardoned for your sin. What else? There's some more in here. Look at verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with them to fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. The secret of the Lord, to know the mysteries of God. I can't even imagine how God operates and how God works if I have not been pardoned of my sin. The lost community, lost individuals, don't have the slightest idea of how God works. One of the greatest questions among the lost world is why does God allow the things to happen that He allows? Well, you know, that's actually a pretty easy question, but to the lost world, it's not. It's a tough one. To the lost world, they say, he must be a pretty mean God that would let, you know, little children die before they're even out of the womb. He must be a pretty evil God to let people, you know, to to send people to hell. He must, and by the way, I said that correctly. I know a lot of people say God doesn't send anybody to hell. Yes, he does. Just for the record. Yes, he does. You can study that out on your own, but yes, he does. I can't believe that God sends people to hell. I can't believe that God would allow all these catastrophes to fall upon the world where people would die. I can't believe that in the Old Testament, when he'd send a man to occupy a land of these people that he didn't love and 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 were rejecting him, that he would let them kill men, women, children, and even their animals. What kind of a God is that? I'm going to tell you what kind of God it is. He is not only a just God, a holy God, but he is also a loving God. He is holy and He is just in that sin came into the world. Sin opposes everything that God is. And sin has brought all of those things about. He is a loving God in that He knows those things exist. So much so that He sends His only begotten Son to have to face death, to have to deal with death, sacrifice His life so that you and I can escape all of that. It's not an unloving God who offers you an opportunity to escape that, and you reject it. You know, here's what we need to understand about all of that. We need to understand that there's two ways that God works. Number one, He has a permissive will. A permissive will is simply this, that He allows things to take place with His permission that aren't necessarily those things that delights Him. He allows them to happen. For example, when Satan approached Him... Uh, with the ways in which he could cause Job uh, to try to trip Job up so that he would curse God. Um, God gave him the ability to do that. He gave him permission to do a degree of that, but he won't let him go so far. He allows him to do things within certain boundaries. Today, he allows certain events to occur based upon man's desire, man's sin, Satan's deception. He allows those things to happen within certain boundaries. You can't go beyond what God is going to do and takes place in the course of time. But there are certain things that he allows to take place, but they won't interfere with his ultimate plan, which is what's called his sovereign will. His sovereign will is this, that God has a plan that's not going to be altered. When we read the Bible and we see what's going to take place, those are things that's going to take place and nothing's going to change that. Now, between now and then, there's going to be death. Between now and then, there'll be corruption. Between now and then, we'll see a lot of things that happen. But God's plan is going to be fulfilled because God's sovereign will is not going to be interrupted. Now, after having said all of that, there is this sin factor. When sin came into the world, the curse of sin came in with it. And understand and know that sin has disrupted the perfect world that God created. In fact, uh, sin has brought about death, brought about destruction, brought about rebellion, even disruption in nature itself. It's man that brought those things in when he sinned against God. God doesn't sit back and and just decide, you know, uh, all of these things arbitrarily. He says, I'm going to let these things take place and play out because sin brought them into play. Sin brought them into play. We need to understand that, listen, sin has created these things. Sin has brought all these. It isn't that God has decided all of these things are going to happen. It's a sin. 
brought all of these things into existence. And, and, all, and sin has created the pride. Sin has created the rebellion. Sin has brought about this rejection. And then we cry, God, how can you let this happen? Rebellion, rejection, sin, your pride, your arrogance. And we look at all of that and we say, huh, I guess I get it. Sin is terrible. I get that. I would imagine you get that. There is a mystery that God gives us when our sins are pardoned. We're able to see this and we're able to understand, you know, a God that pardons me of the sin that I had in my life, the very nature to sin, not only that, but the sins I committed, for God to have pardoned me for all of that, I know about His love. I get it. And I can see that a lot of the things that took place in my life took place because of my rejection, because of my rebellion, because I wanted nothing to do with Him. I get it. I can see that because I've been pardoned for my sin. I get it. But a lost world who is not pardoned for their sin, doesn't get it. They can't see it. They're not privy to the mystery being revealed as we are. So the sin factor plays a big part. So to those that have been pardoned, we can answer that. We get it. You know, it's kind of interesting because when you look at some of the things the world teaches, such as evolution, is a good example, uh, is a picture of things you know, getting better, evolving, that's what evolution is, evolving. So supposedly, in evolution, things should be getting better. Amen? But yet there's still death and destruction. It's amazing. Things are getting better, but yet at the same time, things are disastrous. They claim evolution. Man, we've got to hold to this. We've got to believe this. But then they start looking at the world and going, you know what? We're going to fall apart, man. Why? Is it going on a downward spiral? I thought we were on an upward spiral. If, if we're evolving, it should be getting better, not worse. And then, like I said this morning, then they want to throw this line at you. How does, a, how does your God let these things happen? What do you mean, my God? You say there is no God, except when it's horrible and things are going bad, then all of a sudden you want to blame my God. Either believe God or don't believe God. Either believe He exists or don't believe He exists, but you can't play both worlds. You can't say we're getting better and evolution is growing and, and evolution's a fact and these things are really happening and then go back and say, oh, by the way, things are terrible because of your God. Make up your mind. Either you're going to believe He's true or you're not going to believe He's true. But you can't play both ends. Death and destruction are real. And if we look at Scripture, we understand and know that, listen, sin brought in both. Sin has brought them into our existence, brought them into our world. And if evolution were true, things should be getting better. But because it's not, we understand that sin is prevalent. And because sin is prevalent, things aren't getting better. And the Bible tells us things aren't getting better. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. It's falling apart. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. You know, as pardoned people, we know firsthand the mysteries. And I say firsthand because, I mean, we have, a, I don't mean to oversimplify this, but we have the opportunity to sit at our Savior's feet and cry, Abba, Father. We have the opportunity to see and hear things and know things that the rest of the world can't possibly know. I used to love spending time with my dad. I mentioned that this morning. Often I would go on visits with him. I'd go on errands. I'd do chores, sometimes go to work with him. I did all of those things, and I so enjoyed listening to the instructions and just spending quality time with him. And I learned things about my dad that the average person would never know because I saw firsthand how he dealt with this situation. I saw firsthand how he would deal with that situation. I saw firsthand how he would love people. I saw firsthand how he would sacrifice his time and effort. I saw firsthand how he'd grab his wallet and dump money in people's hands that he didn't have. I saw firsthand what he would do. I witnessed it. Why? Because I could sit at his feet, cry, Abba, Father had that relationship with him. He was my dad. We have a relationship with the Father that 
others don't have. It's an amazing relationship. And there are things we know about God that nobody else can possibly know, can't witness. I know how God got me through times in my life that were tough. I know how God has settled things in other people's lives. I've watched him work. I've seen him do things that, to me, seem unimaginable. Bolder are miraculous, if not miraculous. I've watched and I've learned. You know, not only that, but it's an amazing thing to see God's covenant with man. Why would God want to be, have an agreement with man? Rebel against him, turn on him, spit on him, stab him, send him to the cross, nail him to the cross. Why would he want a covenant with man? His grace, his mercy, his love, his sacrifice is more than I can understand. It's overwhelming. But I will tell you this, I'm a recipient of it, and I can sit at his feet because my sins have been pardoned. You know, going back to my dad, the things I learned most of those days I spent with my dad was the price, the work, the effort, the sacrifice he put into people. The love that he put into what he did, whether it was his family, whether it was his church. I've watched him shed tears, spend money he didn't have to spend, take the time away from things he needed to be doing to care for the needs of others. The closer I walked with my dad, the more I learned about him. The closer I walked with my God, the more those mysteries were opened up and, and a great revelation of what Jesus Christ can do in my life is opened up. Last one, I'm going to hit just real fast. I'm out of time. Kind of like Jacques, I got a little overboard tonight. But the last one is this. To be pardoned for my sin is necessary to escape Satan's snares. To escape Satan's snares. Look at what he says in verse 15. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. You know, living in sin... People don't realize it, but living in sin is living in a snare. It's the idea that Satan has taken control. He's a master deceiver, father of lies. He's an accuser. He can be a wolf in sheep's clothing. He can be an angel of light. He imprisons people without people knowing they've been imprisoned. He holds them captive without them knowing they've been held captive. You know, you can talk to a lot of a lot of, let's just say, uh, an alcoholic or a drug addict, and, and a lot of them will tell you, oh, I could stop at any moment, but they can't stop at any moment. It's the same snare that Satan holds over people. It's that same snare. It's the idea that they don't realize that he has control of them. I mean, they look at their life and they think, man, everything is going well. Man, they live an affluent lifestyle. They're good parents. They even maybe live morally, but realize it or not, they're in Satan's snare if they've rejected Jesus Christ. They've not been pardoned for their sin. You know, while doing prison ministry, I had mentioned earlier, the one thing I heard often was this, I just can't seem to break free of the life that I live. And it was a true statement. They knew that when they got out of jail, they could be in there and they could try to get their life straightened away. There was no drugs for them to take. There was no alcohol to drink. They could get whatever time they were in there, man, they could get straightened up. But here's what they knew. They knew that when they left that prison, they really had nowhere to go. They're going to go right back to the same house they came from, same family that was there, and the same people that were pounding on the door, selling them the drugs, are going to be there the very day they get home trying to sell the drugs again. They're going to be in the same situation they've always been. The only difference is, is now they've got something on the record, and it's even going to be harder because they can't get a job. They said, I've, I've gotten myself in a place that I can't get out of. Satan's snare is like that. People don't realize it, but he has you right where he wants you to be, and you're in a snare that you can't get out of, and the only hope you have is for Jesus Christ to pardon you of your sins. The only hope you have is in Jesus Christ to give you that liberty to know him. You know, i got to tell you, He'll keep me safe. Doesn't mean that Satan won't try to set a snare. You know, we talked this morning about that path and how he leads and guides us down that path. You know, 
It's kind of an interesting thing, but I think one of the things that uh, has always impressed me in, in, in battle, in combat, when they, were, they would travel through, down certain roads or whatever, there was always these guys out front that are looking for mines or IEDs or whatever there that could cause a lot of damage. And they're out there searching for those to make sure that they don't ride over one of those and, and it blow up on them. They were always out there searching, and they'd come across it. Hey, hey, whoa, 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 we got an IED here. We need to go around it. And so they'd take the path around it. It's not that Satan's not going to set the snare, but with Jesus as our guide, he says, oh, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's a snare. Let me help you around this one. Let me get you around this because I don't want it to hurt you. I want to protect you. I want to watch over you. Only when Christ leads the way that we know where those snares are. And it's only those who are pardoned from sin's penalty that has that privilege. Today, it's important that we understand that we need to be pardoned for sin, from sin. We need that pardon if we're going to be the people God would have us to be. Bow your heads with me tonight, if you would. I want you to think about this for a moment. What is it in my life that might be keeping me from that kind of a fellowship with God? What is it in my life that might be keeping me from having all the blessings God wants me to have? To have the direction God wants me to have? To, to have the, the fellowship with God that I know I need? What is it tonight that maybe is preventing that? Has sin kind of crept in, made its way in your life? If so, well, it's a good opportunity to take it to God. God, forgive me. If you're here tonight and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you've never said, God, listen, I need, I need forgiveness of my sin. I need to be washed and clean. I need it. Lord God, I need to know you like that. Tonight, Lord, I surrender my life to you. Forgive me of my sin. Lord God, I, I love you and I want to be your child. I trust that you died for my sins and, and I trust that my sins can be washed and cleansed if I'll but trust you and believe that to be true. Tonight, can you let God do that in your life? Dear Father, I pray, speak to our hearts, speak to our lives. Lord God, if there's anybody here tonight who needs to trust you, please don't let them put it off. Please, Father. I pray, Lord, that you'll lead and guide us tonight. May your will be done. Speak to our hearts and our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand if you would.